Today I'm getting a book. I just got it. Mm, it's called twenty twenty thousand mm, twenty thousand leagues under the sea. Because mm, it's a story about the sea. Sounds interesting. Mm, haven't read many of her books yet. I used to read a lot. Back in my world. Mm, so let's see what is this up to. Mm. I'm not quite sure what I just discovered. Never seen those. Mm. I use for. Part one, a shifting reef. The year eight, uh, I'm not quite sure, I haven't quite gotten a grasp of your language yet. I don't know how you read numbers. The year uh, 1866 was signalized by a remarkable incident, a mysterious and inexplicable phenomenon, which doubtless no one has yet forgotten. Not to mention rumors which agitated the maritime population and excited the public mind, even in the interior of continents, seafaring men were particularly excited. Americans, common sailors, captains of vessels, skippers, both of Europe and America, naval officers of all counters, and the governments of several states on the two continents were deeply interested in the matter. For some time past, vessels had been met by an enormous, enormous thing, a long object, spindle-shaped, occasionally phosphorescent and infinitely larger and more rapid in its movements than a whale. Hmm. The facts relating to the apparition, entered in various logbooks, agreed in most respects as to the shape of the object or creature in question. The untiring rapidity of its movements, its surprising power of locomotion, and the peculiar life with which it seemed endowed. If it was a cetacean, it su surpassed in size all those hitherto classified in science. Taking into consideration the mean observations made by divers at times, rejecting the timid estimate of those who assigned to this object a length of 200 feet, equally if the exaggerated opinions, if set down as a mile in width, and three in length. We might fairly conclude that this mysterious being surpassed greatly all dimensions admitted by ichthyologists of the day, if it existed at all. And that it 
this disease was an undeniable fact. And with that tendency which disposes the human mind in favor of the marvels, we can understand the excitement produced in the entire world by this supernatural operation. As to classing it on the list of fables, the idea was out of the question. On the 20th of July, uh, 1866, the steamer governor Higginson of the Calcutta and Burnack Steam Navigation Company had met this moving mass five miles off the east coast of Australia. Captain Baker thought it at first that he was in the presence of unknown sandbank. He even prepared to determine its exact position when two columns of water projected by an explicable object shot with a hissing noise 150 feet up in the air. Now, Unless the seed bank, sand bank had been submitted to the intermittent eruption of a geyser, the governor Higginson had to do neither more nor less than with an aquatic mammal, unknown to them, which threw up from it its blowholes, columns of water mixed with fire and vapor. Similar facts were observed on the 23rd of July in the same year in the Pacific Ocean by the Columbus, one of the West India and Pacific Steam Navigation Company. But this extraordinary cetaceous creature could transport itself from one place to another with surprising velocity, as in an interval of three days, the Governor Higginson and the Columbus had observed it at two different points of the chart separated by a distance of more than 700 nautical leagues. That seems like a long distance. Fifteen days later, 2,000 miles further off, the Helvetia of the Compagnie Nationale and the Shannon of the Royal Mail Steamship Company, sailing to windward in in that portion of the Atlantic lying between the United States and Europe, respectively, signaled the monster to eat in 42.50 latitude and 60 degrees, 35 degrees west longitude. In the simultaneous observations, they thought themselves justified in estimating the minimum length of the mammal at more than 350 feet, as the Shannon and Helvetia were of smaller dimensions than it, though they measured 300 feet overall. Now the largest whales, those which frequent those parts of the sea around the Aleutian, Kulanmak and Ungulati Island, have never exceeded a length of 60 yards. If they attain that, these reports arriving one after the other with fresh observations made on board the transatlantic ship Pereire, a collision which occurred between the Etna of the Inman line and the monster, a process verbal directed by the officers of the French frigate Normandy, a very accurate survey made by the staff of Commodore Fitzjames on board the Lloyd Clyde, greatly influenced public opinion. That's so many names. With grave practical counters such as England, America and Germany treated the matter more seriously. In every place of great resort the monster was the fashion. They sang of it in the cafes, ridiculed it in the papers and he presented it on the stage. All kinds of stories were circulated regarding it. There appeared in the papers caricatures of every gigantic and imaginary creature, from the white whale, the terrible Moby Dick of Hyperborean regions, the immense kraken whose tentacles could entangle a ship of 500 tons, and nurry it into the abyss of the ocean. Those, those seem to be something quite mighty like a kraken. Mm -hmm. 
The legends of ancient times were even resuscitated, and the opinions of Aristotle and Pliny revived, who admitted the existence of these monsters, as well as the Norwegian tales of Bishop Pontopidian, the accounts of Paul Hegede, and, most of all, the reports of Mr. Warrington, his good faith no one could suspect, who affirmed that, being on board of the Castilian in 1857, he had seen this enormous serpent, which had never until that time frequented any other seas but those of the ancient Constitutional. Then burst forth the interminable controversy between the credulous and the incredulous on the society's savants and scientific journals. The question of the monster inflamed all minds. Editors of scientific journals, quarreling with believers in the supernatural, spilled seas of ink during this memorable campaign. Some even drank blood, for, from the sea serpent, they came to direct personalities. For six months, war was waged with various fortune in the leading articles of the Geographical Institution of Brazil, the Bravo Academy of Science of Berlin, the British Association, the Smithsonian Institution of Washington, and discussions of the Indian Archipelago, of the cosmos of Abbe Moino, in the Mittenungen of Petermann, in the scientific chronicles of great journals of France and other countries. The cheaper journals were piled keenly and with an exhaust possessed. The satirical writers parodied their remark of Lemerus, quoted by the adversaries of the monster, maintaining that nature did not make fools, and adjured their contemporaries not to give the lie to nature by admitting the existence of krakens, sea serpents, moby dicks, and other lucubrations of delirious sailors. At the length of an article in a well-known satirical journal, by a favorite contributor. The chief of the staff settled the monster, like Hippolytus, giving it the death blow amidst an universal burst of laughter. Wit had conquered science. Mm. These things do exist, though. I'm not sure what's so absurd about it. Maybe in your world? Mm. During the first months of the year 1867, the question seemed buried, never to revive, when new facts were brought before the public. It has been no longer a scientific problem to be solved, but a real danger seriously to be avoided. The question took quite another shape. The monster became a small island, a rock, a reef, but a reef of indefinite and shifting proportions. On the 5th of March, 1865, uh, the Moravian of the Montreal Ocean Company, finding herself during the night in 27 degrees 20 latitude and 72 degrees 50 longitude, struck on her starboard quarter rock, marked in no chart for that part of the sea. Under the combined efforts of the wind and its 400 horsepower, it was going at the rate of 13 knots. Had it not been for the superior strength of the hull of the Moravian, she would have been broken by the sheer shock and gone down with the uh, 237 passengers she was bringing home from Canada. The accident happened about 5 o'clock in the morning, as the day was breaking. The officers of the quarter deck hurried to the after part of the vessel. They examined the sea with the most scrupulous attention. They saw nothing but a strong eddy about three cables length distant, 
as if the surface had been violently agitated. The bearings of the place were taken exactly, and the Moravian continued its, its route without apparent damage. Hmm. Had it struck a submerged rock or an enormous wreck? They could not tell. But on examination of the ship's bottom when undergoing repairs, it was found that part of her keel had, was broken. This fact, so grave in itself, might perhaps have been forgotten like many others, if, two weeks after, it had not been reenacted under similar circumstances. But thanks to the national nationality of the victim of the shock, thanks to the reputation of the company to which the vessel belonged, the circumstance became extensively circulated. So they only gave it an attention because the person involved. The 13th of April, 1867, the sea being beautiful, the breeze favorable, the Scotia of the Cunard Company's line found herself in 80 degrees, 12 longitude, and 45 degrees, 37 latitude. She was going at the speed of 13 knots and a half. At 17 minutes past four in the afternoon, whilst the passengers were assembled at lunch in the great salon, a slight shock was felt in the hull of the Scotia. On her quarter, a little off the port paddle. The Scotia has not struck, but she had been struck, and similarly by something really sharp and penetrating than blunt. The shock had been so slight that no one had been alarmed. Had it not been for the shouts of the carpenter's watch, Russia to the bridge, exclaiming, We are sinking! We are sinking! At first the passengers were much frightened, but Captain Anderson hastened to reassure them. The danger could not be imminent. The Scotia, divided in seven compartments by strong partitions, could brave with impunity any leak. Captain Anderson went down immediately into the hold. He found that the sea was pouring into the fifth compartment, and the rapid rapidity of the influx proved that the force of the water was considerable. Fortunately, this compartment did not hold the boilers, or the fires would have been immediately extinguished. Captain Anderson ordered the engines to be stopped at once, and one of the men went down to ascertain the extent of the injury. Some minutes afterwards they discovered the existence of a large hole of two yards in diameter in the ship's bottom. That seems bad. How are they able to keep that contained? Then again, your ships here are very different than what I'm used to. Mm. Such a leak could not be stopped, and the Scotia, her paddles half submerged, was obliged to continue her course. She was then 300 miles from Cape Clear, and after three days' delay, which caused great uneasiness in Liverpool, she entered the basin of the company. The engineers visited the Scotia, which was put in dry dock. They could scarcely believe it possible, a two yards and a half below watermark was a regular rent, in the form of an isosceles triangle. The, bo the broken place in the iron plates was so perfectly defined that it could not have been more neatly done by a punch. It was clear, then, that the instrument protruding the perforation was not a common stamp and after having been driven with prodigious strength and piercing an iron plate one thirty-eight inches thick had withdrawn itself by a retrograde motion truly inexplicable. 
Such was the last fact, which resulted in exciting once more, exciting once more the torrent of public opinion. From this moment, all unlucky casualties which could not otherwise be accounted for were put down to the monster. Upon this imaginary creature rested the responsibility of all these shipwrecks, which unfortunately were considerable, for of 3,000 ships was lost as annually record, recorded at Lloyd's, the number of sailing and steamships supposed to be totally lost from the absence of all news amounted to not less than 200. 200 record ships. Now, it was the monster who, justly or unjustly, was accused of their disappearance. And thanks to it, communication between different continents became more and more dangerous. The public demanded peremptorily that the seas should, at any price, be relieved from this formidable cetacean. My students know an isosceles triangle is one of two equal sides. Mm. At a period when these events took place, I had just returned from a scientific research in the disagreeable territory of Nebraska in the United States. In virtue of, of, of my office as an assistant professor in the Museum of Natural History in Paris, the French government had attached me to that expedition. After six months in Nebraska, I arrived in New York towards the end of March, laden with a precious collection. My departure for France was fixed for the first days in May. Meanwhile, I was occupying myself in classifying my mineralogical, botanical, and zoological riches, when the accident happened to the Scotia. I was perfectly up in that subject, which was the question of the day. How could I be otherwise? I read, read and reread all the American and European papers without being any nearer a conclusion. This mystery puzzled me. On the impossibility of forming an opinion, I jumped on a stream, from one stream to the other, that there really was something could not be doubted, and the incredulous were invited to put their finger on the wound of the Scotia. On my arrival at New York, the question was at its height. The hypothesis of the floating island and the unapproachable sandbank, supported by minds like company little competent to form a judgment was abandoned. And, indeed, unless this show had a machine in its stomach, how could it change its position with such astonishing rapidity? From the same cause, the idea of a floating hole of an enormous wreck was given up. There remained then only two possible solutions of the question, which created two distinct parties. On one side, those who were for a monster of colossal strength. On the other, those who were for a submarine vessel of enormous motive power. Make sense? But this last hypothesis, plausible as it was, could not stand against inquiries made in both words that a private gentleman should have such a machine at which command was most likely. Where, when, and how was it built? And how could its construction have been kept secret? Certainly, a government might possess such destructive machine. And in these disastrous times, when the ingenuity of man has multiplied the power of weapons of war, it was possible that, without the knowledge of others, a state might try to work such a formidable engine. After the chasse pods came the torpedoes, after the torpedoes the submarine rams, then the reaction, at least I hope so. But the hypothesis of a war machine fell before the declaration of governments. 
as public interest was in question and transatlantic, transatlantic communication suffered, their veracity could not be doubted. But how admit was the construction of this submarine boat that had escaped the public eye? For a private gentleman to keep a secret under such circumstances would be very difficult, and for a state whose every act is persistently what by powerful rivals, certainly impossible. After inquiries made in England, France, Russia, Prussia, Spain, Italy and America, even in Turkey, the hypothesis of submarine monitor was definitely rejected. Upon my arrival in New York, several persons did me the honor of consulting me on the phenomenon in question. I had published in France a working quarto in two volumes entitled Mysteries of the Great Submarine Grounds. This book, highly approved of in the learned world, gained for me a special reputation in this rather obscure branch of natural history. My advice was asked. As long as I could deny the reality of the fact, I confined myself to a decided negative. Soon finding myself driven in a corner, I was obliged to explain myself categorically. And even the Honorable Pierre Aronnax, professor in the Museum of Paris, was called upon by the New York Herald to express a definite opinion of some sort. I did something. I spoke, for want of power to hold my tongue. I discussed the question in all its forms, politically and scientifically, and I give here an extract from a carefully studied article which I published in the number of the 13th of, of April. It ran as follows. After examining one by one the different hypotheses, reject, rejecting all other suggestions, it becomes necessary to admit the existence of a marine animal of enormous power. The great depths of the ocean are entirely unknown to us. Soundings cannot reach them. What passes in those remote depths? What beings live or can live? 12 or 15 miles beneath the surface of the waters? What is the organization of these animals? We can scarcely conjecture. However, the solution of the problem submitted to me may modify the form of the dilemma. Either we do know all the varieties of beings which people on our planet, or we do not. If we do not know them all, if nature still has secrets, in ichthyology form. For us, nothing is more conformable to reason than to admit the existence of fishes, or cetaceans of so other kinds, or even of new species, of an organization formed to inhabit the, strat the strata inaccessible to soundings, and which an ancient an accident of some sort, if fantastical or capricious, has brought at long intervals to the upper level of the ocean. Hi. If, on the contrary, we do know all living kinds, we must necessarily seek for the animal in question amongst those marine beings already clustered. And in that case, I should be disposed to admit the existence of a gigantic narwhal. Narwhal. One of the teeth of this huge mammal is an enormously developed tusk, which may be as long as 10 feet. The tusk furnishes valuable ivory. The creature itself yields a very fine kind of oil. That won't make sense to the damage. The common narwhal, or unicorn of the sea, often attains a length of 60 feet. 
increase its size fivefold or tenfold, give its strength proportionate to its size, lengthen its destructive weapons, and we'll obtain the animal required. That will have the proportions determined by the officers of Senon, the instrument required by the perforation of the scotia, and the power necessary to pierce the hull of the steamer. Indeed, the narwhal is armed with a sort of ivory sword, a halberd, according to the expression of certain naturalists. The principal tusk has the hardness of steel. Some of these tusks have been found buried in the bodies of whales, which the unicorn always attacks with success. Others have been drawn out, not without trouble, from the bottoms of ships, which they had pierced through and through, as a, gim as a gimlet pierces a barrel. The Museum of Faculty of Medicine of Paris possesses one of these defensive weapons, two yards and a quarter in length, and fifteen inches in diameter at the base. Very well. Suppose this weapon to be six times stronger, and the animal ten times more powerful. Launch it at the rate of twenty miles an hour, and obtain a shock capable of producing the catastrophe required. To further information, therefore, I shall maintain it to be a sea unicorn of colossal dimensions, armed not with, not with a halberd, but with a real spur, as the armored frigates, or the realms of war, was massiveness and motive power it would possess at the same time. Thus, this may be an unspeakable phenomenon explain it, unless there be something and above all that one has ever conjectured, seen, perceived, or experienced, which is just within the bounds of possibility. And that's the end of his article. These last words were cover cowardly on my part, but at the same point, I wish to shatter my dignity as professor and not give too much cows for laughter to the Americans, who laugh well when they do laugh. I reserved for myself a way of escape. In effect, however, I admitted the existence of the monster. My article was warmly discussed, which procured it to a high reputation. It rallied round it a certain number of partisans. The solution it proposed it gave, at least, full liberty to the, to the imagination. The human mind delights in grand conceptions of supernatural beings, and the sea is precisely their, la their best vehicle, the only medium through which these giants, against which terrestrial animals, such as elephants or rhinoceros, are nothing, can be produced or developed. The industrial and commercial papers treated the question chiefly from this point of view. The shipping and mercantile gazette, the Lloyd's List, the packet boat, and the maritime and colonial review, all papers devoted to insurance companies which threatened to raise the rates of premium, were anonymous on this point. Public opinion had been produ had been pronounced. The United States The United States were the first in the field, and in the in New York they made preparations for an expedition destined to pursue this narwhal. A frigate of great speed, the Abraham Lincoln, was put in commission as soon as possible. The arsenals were opened to Commander Farragut, who hastened the army of his frigate, but, as it always happens, the moment was decided to pursue the monster. The moment was, it was decided to pursue the monster, the monster did not appear. For two months, no one heard it spoken of. 
No sheep met with it. It seemed as if the unicorn knew of the plot swiving around it. It had been so much talked of, even through the Atl Atlantic cable, that jesters pretended that the slender fly had stopped the telegram on its passage and was making the most of it. Clever unicorn. So when the frigate had been armed for a long campaign and provided with formidable fishing apparatus, no one could tell what course to pursue. Impatience grew apace when, on the 2nd of July, they learned that a steamer of the line of San Francisco from California to Shanghai had seen the animal three weeks before in the North Pacific Ocean. The excitement caused by this news was extreme. The ship was revictualized and well stocked with coal. Three hours before the Abraham Lincoln left Brooklyn Pier, I received a letter worded as follows. To mm. so Mr. Arbonax, professor in the Museum of Paris, Fifth Avenue Hotel, New York. Sir, if you will consent to join the Abraham Lincoln in this expedition, the government of the United States will with pleasure see France represented in the, in the enterprise. Commander Farragut has a cabin at your disposal. Very cordially yours, J.B. Ro Robson, Secretary of Marine. Chapter 3 I Form My Resolution Three seconds before the arrival of G.B. Robson's letter, I no more thought of pursuing the unicorn than of attempting the passage of the North Sea. Three seconds after reading the letter of the Honorable Secretary of Mar Marine, I felt that my true vocation, the sole end of my life, was to chase this disturbing monster and purge it from the world. But I had just returned from a fatiguing journey, weary and longing for repose. I aspired to nothing more than again seeing my country, my friends, my little lodging, bird jardin this plants, my dear and precious colophons. But nothing could keep me back. I forgot all, fatigue, friends and collections, and accepted without hesitation the offer of the American government. Besides, thought I, our roads lead back to Europe, for my, for my particular benefit, and I will not worry me towards the coast of France. This worthy animal may allow itself to be caught in the seas of Europe, for my particular benefit. And I will not bring back less than a half of his ivory halberd to the Museum of Natural History. But in the meanwhile, I must seek this narwhal in the North Pacific Ocean, which, to return to France, was taking the road to the Antipodes. Conseil, I called in an impatient voice. Conseil my, my was my servant, a true devoted Flemish boy, who had accompanied me in all my travels. I liked him, and he returned the liking well. He was phlegmatic by nature, regular but from principle, zealous from habit, evincing little disturbance at the different surprises of life, very quick with his hands, and apt at any service required of him. And despite his name, ever giving advice, even and asked for it. Conseil had followed me for the last ten years wherever science led. Never once did he complain of the length or fatigue of a journey, never made an objection to pack his portmanteau for whatever country it might be, or however far away, whether China or Congo. Besides all this, he had good health, which defied all sickness and solid muscles, but no nerves, good morals are understood. 
This boy was 30 years old and his age to that of his master as 15 to 20. May I be excused for saying that I was 40 years old? But Conseil had one fault. He was ceremonious to a degree and will never speak to me but in the third person, which was sometimes provoking. Conseil, said I again, beginning with feverish hands to make preparations for my departure. Certainly, I was sure of his devoted boy. As a rule, I never asked him if it were convenient for him or not to follow me in my travels. But this time the expedition in question might be prolonged, and the enterprise might be hazardous in pursuit of an animal capable of sinking a frigate as easily as a nutshell. Here there was a matter of her reflection even to the most impassable man in the world. What would Conseil say? Conseil, he called the third time. Conseil appeared. Did you call me, sir? said he, entering. Yes, my boy. Make preparations for me and yourself too. We leave in two hours. As you please, sir, Look, replied Consul quietly. Not an instant to lose. Locking my trunk, all traveling utensils, coats, shirts and stockings, without counting, as many as you can, and make haste. And your collection, sir, observed Consul. We will think of them by and by. What? The Archaeotherium? The Hieracotherium? The Orchodons? The Cherapotamus? And the other skins? They will keep them at the hotel. And your larvae barbirosa, sir? They will feed it during our absence. Besides, I will give orders to forward our menagerie to France. We are not returning to Paris, then, said Consul. Oh, certainly, I answered evasively, by making a curve. Will the curve please you, sir? Oh, it will be nothing. Not quite so direct a road, that is all. We take our passage in the Abraham Lincoln. As you think proper, sir coolly replied Consul. You see, my friend, it has to do with the monster, the famous narwhal. We are going to purge it from the seas. The author, the author of a work in quarto in two volumes on the myster mysteries of the great submarine grounds cannot forbear embarking the author of a work in quarto in two volumes on the mysteries of the great submarine grounds cannot forbear embarking with Commander Farragut. A glorious mission, but a dangerous one. We cannot tell where we may go, these animals can be very capricious. But we will go when... Very capricious. But we'll go whether or not we have got a captain who is pretty wide awake. I opened the credit account for Babirosa and console following, I jumped into a cab. Our luggage was transported to the deck of the frigate immediately. I hastened on board and asked for Commander Farragut. One of the sailors conducted me to the poop where I found myself in the presence of a good-looking officer, who held out his hand to me. Monsieur Pierre Aronnax, said he. Himself, replied I. Commander Farragut? You are welcome, Professor. Your cabin is ready for you. I bowed and desired to be conducted to the cabin destined for me. The Abraham Lincoln had been well chosen and equipped for the new destination. She was a frigate of great speed, fitted with high pressure engines that admitted a pressure of seven atmospheres. 
Under this, the Abraham Lincoln attained the mean speed of nearly 18 knots in a third an hour. A considerable speed, but nevertheless insufficient, insufficient to grapple with this gigantic cetacean. The interior arrangements of the frigate corresponded to its nautical qualities. I was well satisfied with my cabin, which was in the after part opening upon the gun room. We shall be well off here, said the Council. As well, by your runner's leave, as a hermit crab in the shell of a rock, said the Council. We left Council to stow our trunks conveniently away and remounted the poop in order to survey the preparations for departure. At that moment, Commander Farragut was ordering the last moorings to be cast loose, which held the Abraham Lincoln to the pier of Brooklyn. So in, quarter of, in the quarter of an hour, perhaps less, the frigate would have sailed without me. I should have missed in this extraordinary, supernatural and incredible expedition, the recital of which may well meet with some scepticism. But Commander Farragut would not lose a day nor an hour in scoring the seas in which the animal had been sighted. He sent for the engineer. Is the steam, is the steam full on? asked he. Yes, sir, replied the engineer. Go ahead, cried Commander Farragut. The quay of Brooklyn and all that part of New York bordering on the East River was crowded with spectators. Three cheers burst successively from 500,000 throats. Thousands of handkerchiefs were waved above the heads of the compact mass, saluting the Abraham Lincoln, until she reached the waters of the Hudson, at the point of that elongated peninsula which forms the town of New York. Then the frigate, following the coast of New Jersey along the right bank of the beautiful river, covered with villas, passed between the forts, which saluted her with the heaviest guns. The Abraham Lincoln answered by hoisting the American colors three times. Was thirty nine stars shone resplendent from the mizzen peak, then modifying its speed to take the narrow channel marked by buoys placed in the inner bay formed by Sandy Hook Point. It coasted the long sandy beach, where some thousands of spectators gave it one final cheer. The escort of boats and tenders still followed the frigate and did not leave her until they came abreast of the lightship, whose two lights marked the entrance of New York Channel. Six bells struck, the pilot got into his boat and rejoined the little sconeer which was waiting under her lee. The fires were made up, the screw beat the waves more rapidly, the frigate skirted the low yellow coast of Long Island. And at eight bells, after having lost sight of the northwest of the lights of Fire Island, she ran at full steam on the dark waters of the Atlantic. Chapter 4 Ned Lamb. Captain Farragut was a good seaman, worthy of the frigate he commanded. His vessel and he were one. He was the soul of it. On the question of the cetacean, there was no doubt in his mind, and he would not allow the existence of the animal to be disputed on board. He believed in it as certain as a certain good woman believed in the Leviathan, by faith, not by reason. The monster did exist, and he was sworn to rid the seas of it. He was a kind of knight of Rhodes, a second Diodon de Gozon, 
going to meet a serpent which desolated the island. Either Captain Farragut would kill the narwhal, or the narwhal would kill the captain. There was no third course. The officers, officers on board shared the opinion of their chief. They were ever chatting, discussing, and calculating the various chances of a meeting, watching narrowly the vast surface of the ocean. More than one took up his quarters voluntarily in the cross trees, who would have cursed such a birth under any other circumstances. As long as the sun described its daily course, the rigging was crowded with sailors, whose feet were burned to such an extent by the heat of the deck as to render it unbearable. Still, the Abraham Lincoln had not been yet breasted the suspected waters of the Pacific. As to the ship's company, they desired nothing better than to meet the unicorn, to harpoon it, hoist it on board, and dispatch it. They, were, they watched the sea with eager attention. Besides, Captain Farragut had spoken of a certain sum of $2,000 set apart for whoever should first sight the monster. Were he the cabin boy, common seaman, or often? I leave you to judge how eyes were used on board the Abraham Lincoln. For my own part, I was not behind the others, and left to no one my share of daily observations. This frigate might have been called the Argus for a hundred reasons. Only one amongst us, Consul, summoned to protest by his indifference against the questions which so interested us all, and seemed to be out of keeping with the general enthusiasm on board. I have said that Captain Farragut had carefully provided his ship with every apparatus for catching the gigantic cetacean. No whaler had ever been better armed. They possessed every known engine, from the harpoon thrown by the hand to the barbed arrows of the blunderbuss and the explosive balls of the duck gun. On the forecastle lay the perfection, perfection of a breech-loading gun very thick at the bridge and very narrow in the bore, the model of which had been in the exhibition of 1867. This precious weapon of American origin could throw with ease a conical projectile of 9 pounds to a mean distance of 10 miles. Thus the Abraham Lincoln wanted for no means of destruction, and, what is better still, she had on board Ned Land, the Prince of Harponers. Ned Land was a Canadian, a Canadian with an un uncommon quickness of hand, and one knew no equal in his dangerous occupation. Skill, coolness, audacity, and cunning he possessed in a superior degree, and it must be a cunning whale or a singularly cute cachalot to escape the stroke of his harpoon. Nederland was about 40 years of age. He was a tall man, more than six feet high, strongly built, grave and taciturn, occasionally violent and very passionate when contradicted. His person attracted attention, but above all, the boldness of his look which gave a singular expression to his face. Who calls himself Canadian, calls himself French, and little communicative as Ned Land was, I must admit that he took a certain liking for me. My nationality drew him to me, no doubt. It was an opportunity for him to talk, and for me to hear that old language of rebelize, which is still in use in some Canadian provinces. Their harponer's family was originally from Quebec, and was already a tribe of hardy fishermen when this town belonged to France. Little by little, little by little, Nedland acquired a taste for shutting, and I loved to hear the recital of his adventures in the polar seas.
He related his fishing and his combats with natural poetry of expression. His recital took the form of an epic poem, and I seemed to be listening to a Canadian Homer singing the singing the Hyatt of the Regions of the North. Eliad of the Regions of the North. I am portraying this hard, hardy companion as I really knew him. We are old friends now, united in that unchangeable friendship which is born and cemented amid its amid extreme dangers. So too. Ah, brave Ned, I ask no more than to live a hundred years longer, that I may have more time to dwell the longer on your memory. Now, what was Ned's land, Ned Land's opinion upon the question of the marine monster? I must admit that he did not believe in the unicorn, and was the only one on board who did not share that universal conviction. He even avoided the subject, which I one day thought it my duty to press upon him. One magnificent evening, the 13th of July, that is to say, three weeks after our departure, the frigate was abreast of Cape Blank, 30 miles to leeward of the coast of Patagonia. We had crossed the Tropic of Capricorn, and the Straits of Magellan opened less than 700 miles to the south. Before eight days were over, the Abraham Lincoln would be plough in the waters of the Pacific. Seated on the poop, Ned Land and I were shutting one thing and another as we looked at this mysterious sea, whose great depths had up to this time been inaccessible to the eye of man. I naturally led up the conversation to the giant unicorn, examining the various chances of success or failure of the expedition. But seeing that Ned led me let me speak without saying too much himself, I pressed him more closely. Well, Ned, said I, is it possible that you are not convinced of the existence of the cetacean that we are following? Have you any particular reason for being so incredulous? The harpooner looked at me fixatedly for some moments before answering, struck his broad forehead with his hand, habit of his, as if to collect himself, and said at last, Perhaps I have, Mr. Aronax. But, Ned, you, a whaler by profession, familiarized with all the great marine mammalia, you, whose imagination might easily accept the hypothesis of enormous cetaceans, you ought to be the last to doubt under such circumstances. It is just what deceives you, Professor, replied Ned that the vulgar should believe in extraordinary comets traversing space and in the existence of antediluvian monsters in the heart of the globe may well be when neither astronomer nor geologist believes in such chimeras. As a whaler, I have followed many cetaceans, harpooned a great number, and killed several. But however strong or well-armed they have been, Neither their tails nor their weapons would have been able to even to scratch the iron plates of a steamer. But Ned, they tell us of ships which the teeth of the narwhal has pierced through and through. Wooden ships, that is possible, replied the Canadian. But I have never seen it done. And until further proof, I deny that whales, cetaceans, or sea unicorns could ever produce the effect to describe. Well, Ned, I repeated with a conviction resting on the logic of facts. I believe in the existence of a mammal powerfully organized, belonging to the branch of vertebrata, like the whales, the cachalots, or the dolphins, 
and furnish it with a horn of defense of great penetrating power. Hmm, said the harpooner, shaking his head if the air of a man would not be convinced. Notice one thing, my worthy Canadian, I resume it. If such an animal is in existence, if it inhabits the depths of the ocean, if it frequents the strata lying miles below the surface of the water, it must necessarily possess an organization of an organization the strength of which would defy all comparison. And why this powerful organization? demanded Ned. Because it requires incalculable strength to keep oneself in the strata and resist the pressure. Listen to me. Let us admit that the pressure of the atmosphere is represented by the weight of a column of water, 32 feet high. In reality, the column of water would be shorter, as we are speaking of seawater, the density of which is greater than that of fresh water. Very well. While you dive, Ned, as many times 32 feet of water as there as above you. So many times does your body bear a pressure equal to that of the atmosphere. That is to say, 15 li um, libers, uh, pounds um, for each square inch of its surface. It follows then that at 320 feet this pressure is equal to that of 10 atmospheres, of 100 atmospheres. At 30,200 feet and of a thousand atmospheres at 32,000 feet, that is, about six miles. Which is equivalent to saying that if you could attain this depth in the ocean, each square 13 eighths of an inch of the surface of your body will bear a pressure of 5,600 pounds. Ah, my brave Ned, do you know how many square inches you carry on the surface of your body? I have no idea, Mr. Rubernox. About 6,500. And as in reality, the atmospheric pressure is about 15 pounds to the square inch. Your 6,500 square inches bear at this moment a pressure of 9... Uh, nine seven five hundred pounds without my perceiving it without your perceiving it and if you are not crushed by such a pressure it is because the air penetrates the interior of your body with equal pressure hence perfect perfect equilibrium between the interior and exterior pressure which does neutralize each other and which allows you which allows you to bear it without, without inconvenience. But in the water, it is another thing. Yes, I understand, replied Ned, becoming more attentive. Because the water surrounds me, but does not penetrate. Precisely, Ned, so that in at 32 feet beneath the surface of the sea, you would undergo a pressure of 97,000 500 pounds. At 320 feet, 10 times that pressure. 3,200 feet, 100 times that pressure. And lastly, at 32,000 feet, a thousand times that pressure would be 97,500,000 pounds. That is to say, that you would be flattened as if you had been drawn from the plates of a hydraulic machine. The devil, excla exclaimed Ned. Very well, my worthy harponier. Of some vertebrates several hundred yards long and large in proportion, commandings itself in such depths. Of those whose surface is represented by millions of square inches, that is, by tens of millions of pounds, we must estimate the pressure they undergo. Consider then, what must the resistance of their bonic structure and the strength of their organization to withstand such pressure? 
Why? exclaimed Ned Land. They must be made of iron plates, eight inches thick, like the armored trigrids. As you say, Ned. And think of the destruction power such a mass would cause. If hurled with the speed of an express train against the hull of a vessel. Hmm, yes, certainly, perhaps, replied the Canadian, shaken by these figures, not yet willing to give in. Well, have I convinced you? You have convinced me of one thing, sir, which is that if such animals do exist at the bottom of the seas, they must necessarily be as strong as you say. But if I, they do not exist, mine obstinate harponier, how explain the accident of this culture? Chapter 5 At Adventure Second, but Chapter 5 At Adventure The voyage to the Abraham Lincoln was for a long time marked by no special incident, but one circumstance happened which showed the wonderful dexterity of Ned Land and proved what a confidence we might place in him. The 13th of June, the frigate spoke some American whalers, from whom he learned that they knew nothing about the narwhal. But one of them, but one of them, the captain of the Monroe, knowing that Ned Land had skipped on board the Abraham Lincoln, begged for his help in chasing a whale they had in sight. Commander Farragut, Desirous of seeing Ned Land at work, gave him permission to go on board the Monroe. And fate served our Canadians so well that, instead of one whale, they harpooned two with a double blow, striking one straight to the heart and catching the other after some minutes' pursuit. Decidedly, if the monster ever had to do with Ned Land's harpoon, I would not bet in its favor. The frigate skirted the southeast coast of America with great rapidity. The 3rd of July, we were at the opening of the Straits of Magellan, level with Cape Verdes. But Commander Farragut would not take a turtle's passage, but doubled Cape Horn. The ship's crew agreed with him, and certainly it was possible that they might meet the narwhal in this narrow pass. Many of the sailors affirmed that the monster could not pass there, that it was too big for that. The 6th of July, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the Abraham Lincoln, at 15 miles to the south, doubled on the solitary island, this lost rock at the extremity of the American continent, to which some Dutch sailors gave the name of their native town, Cape Horn. The course was taken towards the northwest, and the next day the screw of the frigate was at last beating the waters of the Pacific. Keep your eyes open, called out the sailors. And they were open widely, both eyes and glasses a little day dazzled, it is true, by the prospect of two thousand dollars. Had not an instant repose.
Day and night, they watch the surface of the ocean, and even Nitalops, whose faculty of seeing in the darkness multiplies their chances of a hundredfold, would have would have had enough to do to gain their prize. I myself, for whom money had no charms, was not the least attentive on board. Giving but a few minutes of my muse, giving but a few minutes to my muse, but a few hours to his lip, indifferent to either rain or sunshine, and I did not leave the poop of the vessel. Now leaning on the netting of the forest castle, now on the taffetail, I devoured with eagerness the soft foam which whitened the sea as far as I, the eye could reach. And how often have I shared the emotion of the majority of the crew when some capricious whale raised its be black back above the waves. The poop of the vessel was crowded in a moment. The cabins poured forth a torrent of sailors and officers, each with having breast and turbid eye watching the course of the cetacean. I looked and looked till I was nearly blind, whilst consul, always phlegmatic, keep repeating in a calm voice. If, sir, you will not squint so much, you would see better. But vain excitement, the Abraham Lincoln checked its speed and made for the animal signaled, a simple world, a common cachalot, which soon appeared amidst a storm of execration. But the weather was good, the voyage was being accomplished under the most favorable auspices. It was when, it was then the bad season in Australia, the July of that zone corresponding to our January in Europe. But the sea was beautiful and easily scanned round a vast circumference. The 20th of July, the Tropic of Capricorn was cut by 105 degrees of longitude, and the 27th of the same month we crossed the equator on the 110th meridian. This passed, the frigate took a more decided westerly direction and scored the central waters of the Pacific. Commander Farragut thought, and it reason, that it was better to remain in deep water and keep clear of continents or islands, which the beast itself seemed to shun. Perhaps because there was not enough water for him, suggested the greater part of the crew. The Fargat passed at some distance from Marquesas and the Sandwich Island, crossed the Tropic of Cancer, and made for the China Seas. We were on the theater of the last diversions of the monsters, and, to say the truth, we no longer lived on board. Hearts palpitated, fearfully preparing themselves for a future incurable aneurysm. The entire ship's crew were undergoing a nervous excitement, of which I can give no idea. They could not eat, they could not sleep, Twenty times a day, a misconception or an optical illusion of some sailors seated on the tough rail would cause dreadful perspirations. And these emotions, twenty times repeated, kept us in a state of excitement so violent that our reaction was unavoidable. And, truly, reaction soon showed itself. For three months, during which a day seemed an age, the Abraham Lincoln furred all the waters of the Northern Pacific, running at wells, making sharp deviations from her course, veering suddenly from, their ta from one attack to another, stopping suddenly, putting on steam, and backing ever and Anon at the risk of deranging her machinery. 
and not, not one point of the Japanese or American coast was left unexplored. <coughs> The warmest partisans of the Enterprise now become, became its most ardent detractors. Reaction mounted from the crew to the captain himself, and certainly, had it not been for resolute determination on the part of Captain Farragut, the frigate would have headed due southward. The useless search could not last much longer. The Abraham Lincoln had nothing to reproach herself with. She had done her best to succeed. Never had an American ship's crew shown more zeal or patience. Its failure could not be placed to their charge. There remained nothing but to return. This was represented to the commander. The sailors could not hide their discontent, and the service suffered. I will not say there was a mutiny on board, but after a reasonable period of obstinacy, Captain Farragut, as Columbus did, asked for three days' patience. If in three days the monster did not appear, the men at the helm should give three turns of the wheel, and the Abraham Lincoln would make for the European seas. This promise was made on the 2nd of November. It had the effect of rallying the ship's crew. The ocean was watched with renewed attention. Each one wished for a last glance in which to sum up his remembrance. Glasses were used with feverish activity. It was a grand defiance given to the giant narwhal, and he could scarcely fail to answer the summons and appear. Two days passed. The steam was at half pressure. A thousand schemes were tried to attract the attention and stimulate the apathy of the animal in case it should be met in those parts. Large quantities of bacon were trailed in the wake of the ship. To the great satisfaction, I must say, of the sharks. <laughs> Small craft radiated in all directions round the Abraham Lincoln as she lay do, as she lay to and did not leave a spot of the sea unexplored. But the night of the 4th of November arrived without the unveiling of the submarine mystery. The next day, the 5th of November, at 12, the delay would, morally speaking, expire. After that time, Commander Farragut, faithful to his promise, was to turn the course to the southeast and abandon forever the north, the north um, regions of the Pacific. The frigate was then in 31 degrees 15 north latitude and 136 42 east longitude. The coast of Japan still remained less than 200 miles to leeward. Night was approaching. They had just struck eight bells. Large clouds veiled the face of the moon, then in its first quarter. The sea undulated peaceably under the stern of the vessel. At that moment, I was leaning toward forward on the starboard's netting. Honso, standing near me, was looking straight before him. Straight the crew perished in the red lines as a mine at the horizon, which contracted and darkened by degrees. Officers with their night glasses scoured the growing darkness. Sometimes the ocean sparkled under the rays of the moon, which, started, which darted between two, two clouds. Then all trace of light was lost in the darkness. In looking at Consul, I could see he was undergoing a little of the general influence. At least I thought so. Perhaps for the first time his nerves vibrated to a sentiment of curiosity. Come, Consul, said I. This is the last chance of pocketing the two hundred the two thousand dollars. May I be permitted to say, sir, replied Consul, 
that I never reckoned on getting the prize, and if the government of the Union offered me a hundred thousand dollars, it would have been none the poorer. You are right, Consul. It is a foolish affair after all, and one upon which we enter too lightly. What time lost? What to those emotions? We should have been back in France six months ago. In your literal room, sir, replied Consul, and in your museum, sir, and I should have already classed all your fossils, sir. And the Babirosa would have been installed in its cage in the jardin des plants, and I have and have drawn all the curious people of the capital. As you say, Consul, I fancy we will run a fair chance of being laughed at for our plans. For our pains. That's tolerably certain, replied the Consul, quietly. I think they will make fun of you, sir. And must I say it? Go on, my good friend. Well, sir, you will only get your desserts. Indeed. When one has the honor of being as savant as you are, sir, one does not expose oneself to. Consul had not time to finish his compliment. In the midst of General Silas, a voice had just been heard. It was the voice of Ned Land shouting. Look out here! The very thing we are looking for on our weather beam! Mm -hmm. I'll be right back. I will go and get um, some tea.
Chapter Six at Fusting. Managing. Somehow. At this cry, the whole ship's crew hurried towards the harponeer. Commander, officers, masters, sailors, cabin boys, even the engineers left their engines, and the stokers their furnaces. <clears throat> the order to stop her had been given, and the frigate now simply went on by her own momentum. The darkness was profound. And however good the Canadian's eyes were, I asked myself how he had managed to see and what he had been able to see. My heart beats as if it would break, but Ned Land was not mistaken, and we all perceived the object he pointed to. At two cables lengths from the Abraham Lincoln on the starboard quarter, the sea seemed to be illuminated all over. It was not a mere phosphoric phenomenon. The monster emerged some fathoms from the water, and then threw out that very intense but inexplicable light mentioned in the report of several captains. This magnificent radiation must have been produced by an agent of great shining power. The luminous part traced on the sea an immense oval, much elongated, the center of which condensed a burning heat whose overpowering brilliancy died out by successive gradations. It is only an agglomeration of phosphoric particles, cried one of the officers. No, sir, certainly not, I replied. Never did folates or salpai produce such a powerful light. That brightness is of an essentially electrical nature. Besides, see, see, it, it moves. It is moving forwards, backwards, it is darting towards us. A general cry rose from the frigate. Silence, said the captain. Up with the helm, reverse the engines. The steam was shut off, and the Abraham Lincoln... Beating the port, the sky described the semicircle. Right the helm, go ahead, cried the captain. These orders were executed and the frigate moved rapidly from the burning light. I was mistaken. She tried to sheer off, but the supernatural animal approached with a velocity double her own. We gasped for breath. Stupefaction more than fear made us dumb and motionless. The animal gained on us, sporting with the waves. It made the round of the frigate, which was then making fourteen knots, and enveloped it with its electric rings like luminous dust. Then it moved away two or three miles, leaving a phosphorescent track, like those volumes of steam that the express trains leave behind. All at once, from the dark line of the horizon, whither it retired to gain its momentum. The monster rushed suddenly towards the Abraham Lincoln with alarming rapidity, stopped suddenly about twenty feet from the hull, and died out, not diving under the water, for its brilliancy did not abate, but suddenly, and as if the source of this brilliant emanation was exhausted. Then it reappeared on the other side of the vessel, as if it had been turned and slid under the hull. Any moment a collision might have occurred which would have been fatal to us. However, I was astonished at the maneuvers of the frigate. 
she fled and did not attack. On the captain's face, general so impassive was an expression of unaccountable astonishment. Mr. Aronnax, he said, I do not know with what formidable being I have to deal, and I will not imprudently risk my frigate in the midst of this darkness. Besides, how attack this unknown thing? How defend oneself from it? Wait for daylight and the scene will change. You have no further doubt, Captain, of the nature of the animal? No, sir, it is evidently a gigantic narwhal and an electric one. Perhaps, added I, one can only approach it if a gymnotopus or a torpedo. Undoubtedly, replied the captain. If it possesses such dreadful power, it is the most terrible animal that ever was created. This is why, sir, I must be on my guard. The crew were on their feet all night. No one thought of sleep. The Abraham Lincoln, not being able to struggle with such velocity, had moderated its pace and sailed at half speed. For its part, the narwhal, imitating the, imitating the frigate, let the waves rock it at will, and Sima decided not to leave the scene of the struggle. Towards midnight, however, it disappeared, or, to use a more appropriate term, it died out like a large glowworm. Had it fled? One can only fear, not hope. But at seven minutes to one o'clock in the morning, at a deafening whistling was heard, like that produced by a body of water rushing with a great violence. The captain, Ned Land, and I were then on the poop, eagerly peering through the profound darkness. Ned Land, asked the commander, have you often heard the roaring of the whales? Often, sir, but never such well as the sight of which brought me in two thousand dollars. If I can only approach within, or within four harpoon lengths of it, but to approach it, said the commander, I ought to be put a whaler at the disposal? Certainly, sir. That will be trifling with the lives of my men. And mine too, simply said the harpooner. Towards two o'clock in the morning, the burning light reappeared, not less intense above five miles to windward of the Abraham Lincoln. Notwithstanding the distance and the noise of the wind and sea, one heard distinctly the loud strokes of the animal's tail, and even its panting breath. It seemed that, at the moment that the normal narwhal had come to breath at the surface of the water, the air was engulfed in its lungs, like the sting in the vast cylinders of a machine of 2,000 horsepower. Hmm, thought I, a well with the strength of a cavalry regiment would be a pretty well. We were on the qui vive till daylight and prepared for combat. The fishing implements were laid along the hammock nettings. The second lieutenant loaded the blunderbusses, which you could throw harpoons to the distance of a mile, and long duck guns with explosive bullets which inflicted mortal wounds even to the most terrible animals. Nedland contented himself with sharpening his harpoon, a terrible weapon in his hands. At six o'clock they began to break, and with the first glimmer of light, the electric light of the narwhal disappeared. At seven o'clock the day was sufficiently advanced, but a very thick sea fog obscured our view, 
and the best spy glasses could not pierce it. That was that caused disappointment and anger. I climbed the mizzen mast. Some officers were already perched on the mastheads. At eight o'clock, the fog lay heavily on the waves, and its thick scrolls rose little by little. The horizon grew wider and clearer at the same time. Suddenly, just as on the day before, Nedland's voice was heard. The thing itself from the port quarter, cried the harpoonian. Every eye was turned towards the point indicated. There, a mile and a half from the frigate, a long blackish body emerged a yard above the waves. Its tail, violently agitated, produced a considerable eddy. Never did a caudal appendage beat the sea with such violence. An immense track of a dazzling whiteness marked the passive of the animal and described a long curve. The frigate approached the cetacean. I examined it thoroughly. The reports of the Shannon and the Helvetia had greatly exaggerated its size, and I estimated its length at only 250 feet. As to its dimensions, I can only conjecture them to be admirably proportioned. While I watched this phenomenon, two jets of steam and water were ejected from its vents, and rose to the height of 120 feet. Thus I ascertained its way of breathing. I concluded definitely that it belonged to the vertebrate branch, class Mammalia. The crew waited impatiently for their chief's orders. The latter, after having observed the animal attentively, called the engineer. The engineer ran to him. Sir, said the commander, you have seen up? Yes, sir, answered the engineer. Well, make up your fires and put on all steam. Three hurrahs greeted this order. This time, for the struggle had, had arrived. Some moments later, the two funnels of the frigate vomited torrents of black smoke, and the bridge quaked on, under the trembling of the boilers. The Abraham Lincoln, propelled by her powerful screw, went straight at the animal. The latter allowed it to come within half a cable's length. Then, as if disdaining to, give, to dive, it took a little turn and stopped a short distance off. This pursuit lasted nearly three quarters of an hour, without the frigate gaining two yards on the cetacean. It was quite evident that at the rate we should at this rate we should never come up with it. Well, Mr. Land, asked the captain, do you advise me to put the boats out to sea? No, sir, reply, replied Ned Land, because we shall not take that be that beast easily. What shall we do then? Put on more steam if you can, sir. If you leave, I mean to post myself under the bowsprit, and if we get within harpooning distance, I shall throw more harpoon. Go, Ned, said the captain. Engineer, put on more pressure. Ned Land went to his post. The fires were increased, the screw revolved 43 times a minute, and the steam poured out of all the valves. We have at the log and calculated that the Abraham Lincoln was going at the rate of eighty and a half miles an hour. But the accursed animal swam too at the rate of eighteen and a half miles. For a whole hour the frigate kept up this pace, 
without gaining six feet. It was humiliating for one of the swiftest sailors in the American Navy. A stubborn anger seized the crew. The sailors abused the monster, who, as before, disdained to answer them. The captain no longer contented himself with twisting his beard. He gnawed at it. The engineer was again called. You have turned full steam in. Yes, sir, replied the engineer. The speed of the Abraham Lincoln increased. Its mass trembled down at the stepping holes, and the clouds of smoke could hardly find way out of the narrow funnels. They heaved the log a second time. Well, asked the captain of the man at the wheel. Nineteen miles and three times, sir. Clap on more steam. The engineer obeyed. The manometer showed ten degrees. But the cetacean grew warm itself, no doubt. For without its training itself, it made it made the nineteen thirty tenth miles. What a pursuit. No, I cannot describe the emotion that vibrated through me. Ned Land kept his post, her pony in hand. Several times the animal let us gain upon it. We shall catch it, we shall catch it, cried the Canadian. But just as he was going to strike, the cetacean stole away with a rapidity that could not be estimated at less than 30 miles an hour. And even during our maximum of speed, it ballied bullied the frigate, going round and round it. A cry of fury broke from everyone. At noon we were no further advanced than at eight o'clock in the morning. The captain then decided to take more direct means. Ah, said he, that animal goes quicker than Abraham Lincoln. Very well. We will see whether it will escape these conical bullets. Send your men to the forecastle, sir. The forecastle gun was immediately loaded and slewed round. The shot passed some feet above the cetacean, which was half a mile off. Another, more to the right, cried the commander, and five dollars to whoever will hit that infernal beast. An old gunner with, gray beard, with a gray beard what I can see now, with a steady eye and grey face, went up to the gun and took a long aim. A loud report was heard, with which were mingled the cheers of the crew. The bullet did its work. It hit the animal but not fatally, and sliding off the rounded surface was lost in two miles deep of sea. The chase began again, and the captain leaning towards me said, I will pursue that beast till my frigate bursts up. Yes, answered I, and you will be quite right to do it. I wish the beast would exhaust itself, and not being sent insensible to fatigue, to fatigue like a steam engine, but it was of no use. While hours passed, without it showing any signs of exhaustion. However, it must be said in praise of the Abraham Lincoln that she struggled on indefatigably. I cannot reckon the distance she made under 300 miles during this unlucky day. November the 6th, but night came on and overshadowed the rough ocean. Now I thought our expedition was at an end, and that we should never again see the extraordinary animal. I was mistaken. At 10 minutes to 11 in the evening, the electric light reappeared three miles to windward of the frigate, as pure, as intense as during the preceding night. The narwhal seemed motionless, perhaps 
tired with its day's work. It slept, letting itself float with the undulation of the waves. Now was a chance of which the captain resolved to take advantage. He gave his orders. The Abraham Lincoln kept up half steam and advanced cautiously so as to not awake its adversary. It is no hard thing to meet in the middle of the ocean whales so sound as sleep that they can be successfully attacked, and Ned Land had harpooned more than one during its sleep. The Canadian went to take his place under the bow spirit. The frigate approached noiselessly, stopped at two cables' lengths from the animal, and followed its track. No one breathed. A deep silence reigned on the bridge. We were not a hundred feet from the burning focus, the light of which increased and dazzled our, our eyes. At this moment, leaning on the forecast of bulwark, I saw below me Ned Land grabbing the martingale in one hand, brandishing his terrible harpoon in the other, scarcely twenty feet from the motionless animal. Suddenly his arm straightened, and the harpoon was thrown. I heard the sonorous stroke of the weapon, which seemed to have struck a hard body. The electric light went out suddenly, and two enormous water sprouts broke over the bridge of the frigate, rushing like a torrent from stem to stem, overthrowing men and breaking the lashing of the spars. A fearful shock followed, and, thrown over the ray without having time to stop myself, I fell into the sea. Chapter 7 An Unknown Species of Whale This unexpected fall so stunned me that I have no clear recollection of my sensations at the time. I was at first drowned to a depth of about twenty feet. I am a good swimmer, though without pretending to rival Byron or Edgar Poe, who were masters of the art, and in that plunge I did not lose my presence of mind. Two vigorous strokes both brought me to the surface of the water. My first care was to look for the frigate. Had the crew seen me disappear? Had the Abraham Lincoln veered round? Would the captain put out a boat? Might I hope to be saved? The darkness was intense. I caught a glimpse of a black mass disappearing in the east, its beacon lights dying out in the distance. It was the frigate. I was lost. Help! Help! I shouted, swimming towards the Abraham Lincoln in desperation. My clothes encumbered me. They cement glued to my body and paralyzed my movements. I was sinking. I was suffocating. Help! This was my, this was my last cry. My mouth filled with water. I struggled against being drawn down the abyss. Suddenly my clothes were seized by a strong hand, and I felt myself drawn up to the surface of the sea, and I heard, yes, I heard these words pronounced in my ear. If Master would be so good as to lean on my shoulder, Master would swim much, with much greater ease. I seized with one hand my faithful consul's arm. Is it you? said I. You? Myself, answered consul, and waiting Master's orders. That shock threw you, threw you as well as me into the sea? No, but being my master's service, I followed him. The worthy fellow thought that was but natural. And the frigate, I asked. The frigate, replied consul, turning on his back. I think that master had better not count too much on her. You think so? I say that, at the time I threw myself into the sea, I heard the men at the wheel say, The screw and the rudder are broken. Broken? 
Yes, broken by the monster's teeth. It is the only injury of the, the Abraham Lincoln has sustained. It is bad. Look out for us. If she no longer answers her helm. Then we are lost. Perhaps so, calmly answered Consul. However, we have still several hours before us, and one can do a good deal in some hours. Consul's imperturbable coolness set me up again. I swam more vigorously, but cramped by my clothes, which struck to me like a laden weight, it felt I felt great difficulty in bearing up. Consul saw this. Will master let me make a slit? said he, and slipping an open knife under my clothes, he ripped them up from top to bottom very rapidly. Then he cleverly slipped them off me, while I swam for both of us. Then I did the same for Consul, and we continued to swim near to each other. Nevertheless, our situation was no less terrible. Perhaps our disappearance had not been noticed, and if it had been, the frigate could not tack, being without its helm. Consul argued on this supposition, and laid his plans accordingly. This phlegmatic boy was perfectly self-possessed. We then decided that, as our only chance of safety was being picked up by the Abraham Lincoln's boats, we ought to manage so as to wait for them as long as possible. I resolved then to husband our strength, so that both would not be exhausted at the same time. And this is how we managed. While none of us lay on our back quite still, with arms crossed and legs stretched out, the other would swing and put the other in front. This towing business did not last more than ten minutes each and we leaving each other's thus, we could swim on for some hours, perhaps to daybreak. Poor chance, but hope is so firmly rooted in the heart of man. Moreover, there were two of us. Indeed, I declare, though it may seem improbable, if I sought to destroy all hope, if I wished to despair, I could not. The collision of the frigate with the cetacean had occurred about eleven o'clock in the evening before. I reckon then we should have eight hours to swim before sunrise, an operation quite practicable if we relieved each other. The sea, very calm, was in our favor. Sometimes I tried to pierce the intense darkness that was only dispelled by the phosphorescence caused by our movements. I watched the luminous waves that broke over my hand, whose mirror-like surface was spotted with silvery rings. One might have said that we were in a bath of quicksilver. Near one o'clock in the morning, I was seized with a dreadful fatigue. My limbs stiffened under the strain of violent cramp. Consul was obliged to keep me up, and our preservation devolved on him alone. I heard the poor boy pant. His breathing became short and hurried. I found that he could not keep up much longer. Leave me, leave me, I said to him. Leave my master? Never, replied he. I will drown first. Just then, the moon appeared through the fringes of a thick cloud that the wind was der driving for the east. It's very loyal. The surface of the sea glittered with its rays. This kindly light reanimated us. My head got better again. I looked at the tall points of the horizon. I saw the frigate. She was five miles from us, and looked like a dark mass, hardly discernible. But no boats. I would have cried out. But what good would it have been at such a distance? The swollen lips would utter no sounds. 
Also, could articulate some words. And I heard him repeat at intervals. Help! Help! Our movements were suspended for an instant. We listened. It might be only a singing in the car, but it seemed to me as if a cry answered the cry from Consul. Did you hear? I murmured. Yes, yes! And Consul gave me one more despairing call. This time there was no mistake. A human voice responded to ours. Was it the voice of another unfortunate creature? Abandoned in the middle of the ocean? Some other victim of the shock sustained by the vessel? A raider, was it a boat from the frigate that was hailing to us in the darkness? Consul made a last effort, and leaning on my shoulder, while I struck out in this in a despairing effort, he raised himself half, half out of the water, then fell back exhausted. What did you see? I saw murmuring he. I saw, but do not talk. Reserve our strength. What had he seen? Then, I know not why, the thought of the monster coming to my head for the first time. That voice? The time is past for Jonas to take her fusion wells bellies. However, Consul was towing me again. He hates his red head sometimes, looked before us and uttered a cry of recognition, which was responded to by a voice that came nearer and nearer. I scarcely heard it. My strength was exhausted, my fingers stiffened, my hand afforded me support no longer. My mouth convulsively opening, filled with salt water. Cold crept over me. I raised my head for the last time, then I sank. At this moment, a hard body struck me. I clung to it. Then I felt that I was being drawn up, that I was brought to the surface of the water, that my chest, that my chest collapsed. I fainted. It is certain that I soon came to, thanks to the vigorous hubbings that I received, I half opened my eyes. Consul, I murmured. Does Master call me? asked Consul. Just then, by the waning light of the moon, which was sinking down to the horizon, I saw a face, a face which was not Consul's, and which I immediately recognized. Ned, I cried. The same, sir, who is seeking his prize, replied the Canadian. Were you thrown into the sea by the shock of the frigate? Yes, professor, but more fortunate than you, I was able to find a floating, a footing, a most directly upon a floating island. An island? Or, more correctly speaking, on our gigantic narwhal. Explain yourself, Ned. Only I soon found out my, my harpoon had not entered his skin and was only blunted. Why, Ned, why? Because, Professor, that beast is made of sheet iron. The Canadian's last words produced a sudden revolution in my brain. I wriggled myself quickly to the top of the beam. Or object, half out of the water, which served us for a refuge. I kicked it. It was evidently a hard, impenetrable body, and not the soft substance that forms the bodies of the great marine mammalia. But this hard body might be a bony carpus, like that of the antediluvian animals. And I should be free to class this monster among amphibious reptiles, just as, just as tortoises or alligators. Well, no. The blackish back of that supported me was smooth, polished, without scales. 
The blow produced a metallic sound, and incredible though it may be, it seemed, I might say, as if it was made of heavated plates. There was no doubt about it. This monster, this natural phenomenon that had puzzled the learned world and overthrown and misled the imagination of seamen of both hemispheres, was, it must be honored, a still more astonishing phenomenon, and as much as it was simply a human construction. We had no time to lose, however. We were lying upon the back of a sort of submarine boat, which appeared as far as I could judge, like a huge figure of steel. Madeleine's mind was made up at this point. Conseil and I could only agree with him. Just then, a bubbling began in the back of the strange thing, which was evidently propelled by a squirrel, and it began to move. We had only just time to seize hold of the upper part, which rose about seven feet out of the water, and rapidly and happily, its speed was not great. As long as it sails horizontally, muttered Ned Land, I do not mind. But if it takes a fancy to dive, I will not give two straws for my life. The Canadian might have said, might have said still less. It became really necessary to communicate with the beings, whatever they were, shut up inside the machine. I searched all over the outside for an aperture, a panel or a manhole, to use a driven into the joints of the iron plates. We were clear and uniform. Besides, the moons appeared then and left us in total darkness. At last, this not long night passed. My indistinct remembrance prevents my describing all the impressions I made. I can only recall my this one circumstance. During some lows of wind and sea, I fancied I heard several times vague sounds, a sort of fugitive harmony produced by distant words of command. What was then the mystery of the submarine craft of which the whole world Vainly saw an explanation? What kind of beings existed in the strange boat? What mechanical agent caused this prodigious speed? Daybreak appeared. The morning mist surrounded us, but they soon cleared off. I was about to examine the hull, which formed on deck a kind of horizontal platform, when I felt it gradually sinking. Oh, confound it, cried Ned Land, kicking the resounding plate. Pen you in hospital rascals? Happily, the sinking movement ceased. Suddenly, a noise, like ironworks violently pushed aside, came from the interior of the boat. One iron plate was moved. A man appeared, but I did not cry and disappeared immediately. Some moments later, eight strong men with masked faces appeared noiselessly and were withdrawn into their formidable machine. I want to continue, but I think I will stop here. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's very tiring to keep talking for so long. I want to keep my beautiful voice. That's too bad though, just so and it got interesting. I read more next Sunday. Mm. 
And next time I think I will be playing a game again. I think it was the same. Continuing on to other flight. Mm. This is actually fun. I hope, hope it was actually fun to listen to as well. So you're not quite sure. And how this how of this works. Mm. Mm, then I hope I'll have some more tea. Right. 